It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tim Jeanette. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and in this video we're taking a look at Yashima, the legend of the Kami Masters. And it's a two to four player game, though you, with ex each expansion you can add another player. Uh, it came out in 2015 by Greenbrier Games. It's designed by Tony Guletti and Joshua Sprung. It takes about 90 minutes. Uh, that's give or take, depending on if you play with two, three, four players or whatever. But basically, it's a small little miniatures game. Each person gets a miniature. They take some cards. They smash them up with another deck of cards. And now you have your life deck in which you use these cards to attack other players and try to kill them. If you're the last person standing or your last team standing, you're the winner of the game. So uh, let's take a look at it and we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think. So here we have the game of Yashima set up for two players, except for I only have one player's cards on the table just because of screen real estate. But essentially, each player is going to get a miniature. In this case, this is a Kiko. You get the miniature, you're going to get their character cards, which will have their starting karma, their hand size, and how fast they can move on their turn. Uh, if they choose a move action, they have a special ability. The other card has some reminder text about their special abilities, along with an adaptability. These adaptabilities go, uh, will be used for different decks in a minute, and I'll show you that. On the back side, we'll come back to this, but some char the characters, when they die, they become restored. Uh, more on that later. And then you have the, the play overview on the back of your uh, character ability card. On top of that, you also have a, de uh, a spell tome here throughout the game you'll have this open and you can cast whatever abilities are open on those pages. So as you flip through your book, you got more and more spells or you have less, maybe powerful ones. And then the farther back that you get to the book, the more powerful your abilities are because it takes a little bit to get there. On top of that, each master has its own deck of 10 cards that's unique to that master. The reason is because you're going to combine these cards with one of the four Kami decks. The game comes with four characters each with their own deck of cards, and then four commies, which are slightly specific to the characters, yet you can combine the commie and master together uh, in any combination. So in this case, this one mostly goes with her, it's Phoenix, she's about dishing out fire all over the place. These decks are different sizes because the decks actually represent your hit points. As you take damage, you're going to lose them off the top of your deck, and then when your deck is gone and whatever's in your hand's gone, you're going to be eliminated. On top of that, you're also going to get a player board. There are, I think, four player boards in the game and then this relic board right here with the two little relics. There's, they're all double-sided. And you can start the relic board and, and play with whatever side you want. We just randomize it. After that, the players are going to pick boards and they have two different sides and you take turns placing them. In a two-player game, it's pretty much going to be this little triangle of terrain. Now, I'm not going to go over every single rule, and I might skip some and forget some, whatever. But mostly, I'm just going to show you an overview of how a round works. We start off with this destiny step. In this destiny step, you're going to put these little action tokens out on the board. There are move and attack action tokens, one on each side. It's going to start the game with basically one per player. And then each player is going to take a token and secretly choose which side they want and all at the same time reveal and add those to the pool. Now that doesn't mean that you have to pick that action throughout the game, but those are the available actions throughout, the first, you know, throughout that round. So moving on, we're gonna go to the Reckon style set. But before we get there, it's probably good to know that you start the game with your hand size of cards. So we got three, we're gonna draw three cards from the top of our deck. You also start the game with your, your starting karma, in this case it's one. All cards have a karma value at the top right. In this case, it is two. The karma uh, is used to pay for the card. You put this beside your character card, basically. But the spell tome I was telling you about have cost requirements and karma that you need to spend to cast these spells. Now we move on to reconcile, which you may or may not do in the first step, but it allows you to discard, I'm sorry, it allows you to put cards from the top, uh, from your hand on the bottom of your deck, because again, your, your deck is hit points, and draw that many cards. It allows you to basically cycle cards out of your hand that you may not need currently. Now, there is a couple keywords in this game that's a little bit confusing the first couple times you play it, such as use, in all caps. If it is a use, 
you take the card and you put it on the bottom of your deck because you're not suffering hit points by using that. You're just like such as when you attack, you use it, it goes on the bottom of your card deck. That's what use is. Discard would actually put it in the discard pile. And as you take damage due to attacks, you're going to lose cards. When you lose cards, those go from either your hand or the top of the deck into the discard. There's a couple of keywords to kind of get used to, but just roll with it for now. Once you get your hand size, everyone's going to flip a card onto their karma pool. In this case, we have a six, and let's just say a Kiko flips out a four. So during this step, which is actually the initiative step, you're going to determine the player order for the round. Any ties will go to the highest attack value on that card, and then past that, I think there's some other tiebreakers. But for now, we're just saying that Kenta, who is this guy, is gonna go first. And these, uh, let me just show you some of those details. They're not bad. I mean, they're PVC, I think. Um, and I think they had a campaign or something on Kickstarter about doing resin models, but these work for now. During your turn, you're gonna have two options. You're gonna have a tome action that you can take, one of these three options, and then you're gonna have a combat action in which you're gonna do a move or attack. So let's just do the combat action. You can do these in either order. If you choose a move action, you're going to take a move token from the pool, and then you're gonna move your speed value, in Kenta's case, is three. So he's gonna move three spaces, uh, just adjacent spaces or whatever. Now, since we're talking about move, let's talk about some of the terrain features that are on the board. Sometimes there's little triangles. When you move into that space, it costs two spaces of movement. There's uh, little hearts, which when you focus, you can heal, which will come on to focus in a minute, or come back to focus in a minute. There are road spaces with little feet. The first space that you move into a turn that has a foot, or not the first space, but the first foot you move into during your turn is free. So if you move three spaces, you can go one, two, three. This would not be free because it was, you know, you can't do two in the same turn. On top of that, you have some deadly terrain over here, which um, is a little skull and crossbones. If you move in them, you exert. When you exert, you actually discard the top card of your draw deck into your discard pile because you suffered a point of damage by moving through dangerous terrain. There's other things in the game that will make you exert as well. Lastly, you have the relic board, which will always be in the game either on this side with two or two of them together like this. And essentially what this allows you to do is when you're next to it and you uh, do a focus action, you get a cool little benefit. If you happen to move away from another player, like say you're adjacent to them and you move away, there is a, you have, do have to exert to get out of combat. However, you can move around them as much as you want. The other action you can do, if you choose, instead of a move, is the attack action. The attack action, you're gonna grab one of the attack tokens and you're gonna play if you want to. You can actually choose to take a token and not do it. So you can choose move or choose attack and not do one, but you're gonna choose one of these cards to attack with. And let's just say, let's just say I was already there, but we're gonna use this to attack. All the attack cards will have a diagram of where you're facing. So in this case, it's more like this. So anyway, let's just say he's facing like this. When you go to attack, you can face any direction. So really the facing doesn't matter as much. There are a couple cards, but he's gonna hit two down, which would be these two spaces right here. So his attack value is a four. And Akiko is basically going to take four points of damage, meaning that she's gonna lose cards from the top of her deck into her discard pile for each damage she takes. Now, there are some cards in the game, which actually the only cards you can really do anything about this with are shield cards. In this case, this is dodge. And dodge says you can lose this card and exert, which means you take one card off the top of your deck. So you're gonna lose this and a card. So you take two hit points essentially, but you get to move one space. And if you move to a space not targeted, prevent all damage. So that's pretty much the attack and the defense, or attack and defense and the move. Some cards have this little burst mark up here, which uh, don't cost an action. And during your turn, you can discard this card and move up to speed to an, or move up to your speed to an adjacent uh, opposing master. It allows you to get right in combat with them because during your turn you're only allowed to either move or attack. That allows you to move and attack essentially, but you have to be able to get into combat with somebody. That's what the combat actions are. We go back to the uh, tome actions and you have focus. Focus allows you to place the top card of your battle deck into your karma pool. So if you need more karma to spend on your abilities in your tome, you can flip these cards over and put them up here. You also have a delve action, which allows you to turn one page in your book, forward or backwards. 
This allows you to cycle through the book. Now, remember, you're only doing one of these tome actions, so you either focus, delve, or the next one, which is called Karma. Karma allows you to spend Karma from your Karma pool to cast the spells that are in your book. So, for instance, here, Kenta has an ability that says, basically, spend three Karma to turn two pages forward in your tome. So it allows him to go faster in his tome. Now, some characters have different types of tome abilities. You have equipped abilities, which you pay to equip them. They go underneath your character card, and they give you a power that you can pretty much use, you know, constantly as a karma action. Um, he also, there's also cards that have imprints, and essentially imprint allows you to place that card into, or on the bottom of your battle deck. So one of the characters has a heal, and you would take that card and place it on the bottom of your deck, and as you cycle through your deck, and this comes up on top, that ability at the bottom would activate. That's pretty much your actions. You you choose one of the three. So you either focus, you you delve, or you you spend karma to spin or to play one of these abilities, and then you get to move and attack or move or attack in the round. Once you've done that, it's your opponent's turn. They will do the same thing, and eventually you'll go back and forth until all these tokens are gone, and that's the end of a round. Now. Throughout the game, as you lose hit points, which is your deck and your hand combined, your karma does not count, if you lose every one of your cards, you become restored. What's going to happen is you're going to flip, there's a bunch of things that happen, but essentially you flip this over, you reshuffle all your cards, and you start over, essentially. Uh, there's more in the rule book, but basically you're out of the rest of that round, but you come back the next round restored. And you actually get more powerful, you get like usually your karma hand and speed increase by one and your special ability gets a little bit more powerful as well. The bad side about that is you basically can't win the game. In a two player game, as soon as somebody becomes restored, the other player wins. So it really never gets to that. If you are playing a three player game, which let me show you the rest of the models here. If you're playing a three or four player game and you can become restored, you're not essentially out. You stay on the board, but your character is essentially turning into a, a restored character, and then next round he starts fighting again, but while you're restored, you can't win the game. Eventually, one player will be left alive, and then you know they'll win the game. If, for some reason, you lose all your cards again while you're restored, you do die. Now, restored works really well in a, a four-player game when you're playing teams, because essentially your teammate can go down, and um, he's, he's still in the game while your other teammate's kind of running away and doing some stuff. But... That's pretty much the game. You just keep playing, and eventually somebody will, in a restored state, you can play at teams, you can play at free-for-all, but that's pretty much the game. I should mention that there are some status effects, such as fire. Uh, one of the masters will throw down fire on the board. They can use cards to blow it up and do damage all in adjacent spaces. Players can get caught on fire, in which during the initiative step, when they flip their uh, karma card, if they got a five or higher, they can cleanse it, otherwise they take a damage. There's some blind that go, goes on. When you're blinded, you actually lose one to your speed. Again, you can when, during the initiative step, you can remove it. There's spirit. One of the masters will cast spirit to increase their hand size by one and speed by one. And then there's finally rancor, which Kenta does, right? Uh, this guy with the sword. He'll basically, as he gets hit, he puts this uh, rancor token on them, and then some cards give him extra bonuses to uh, damage whenever he hits somebody that has rancor on him. Last thing I forgot to mention are these relics, the whole reason this board's in play. Uh, when you focus action and you take one of these cards and put it into your karma pool, if you focus while you're next to one, you actually get to turn any master's tome two pages. So you could turn yours up two, you could turn a teammate's up two, you can turn another player's back two, in which sometimes you'll actually close their book. And that helps you basically derail somebody's plans and getting them away from those really powerful abilities and closing their book. So the fighting kind of happens around here sometimes until later on the game when people are low on hit points, then they run away. Uh, but I guess that depends on the, the group you're playing with. But anyway, so you keep playing until one person's left. So there you have it. That's Yashima. Basically, it's a really fast, fun, two-player miniature game in which you can add more players. I think that it's really fast for the type of game it is with you know with two people you could probably play it in an hour but you can get that down to about 30 minutes i think maybe 35 minutes depending on the players and you know a tournament situation or whatever um, i really think it works well as a team game you know two on two or three on three if you get expansions 
I'm not so much sure about a free-for-all, though that's just me. The way the game rules are written, when you die the first time, you go into that restored state, and if you're the only person that's alive normally, you're the winner of the game. So in a three-player or even a four-player free-for-all, if somebody goes out of the game, they come back restored, they can no longer win the game, but they're trying to kill you still. They're still in the game damaging everyone. So you got a lot of king making going on there because who are they going to attack? The closest player, the player who's winning, uh, or maybe the other players, you know, their friend, whatever. Some people might enjoy that. I absolutely do not like it and probably will never play free-for-alls again. But don't let that persuade you or your decision. If you like that style of stuff, definitely ignore that statement. As a team game and as a one-on-one -on -one game, this is phenomenal. Uh, the card quality is a little thin. I think that even just after you know four or five plays or whatever, it's it's kind of wobbly on the cards. But I'm sleeving them anyway, so it doesn't matter to me. But that might be a concern you have. I would definitely suggest sleeving these just because you're going to be going through them uh, a lot. So either way, it's uh, got some really cool commies. I like the fact that you can mix and match match the decks. You know, the game comes with four guys, comes with four commies. You essentially got a bunch of options there. Now, each deck is really assigned to a specific guy. It has all his artwork and everything, and they work really well together. But it does work well with other decks. I think some combinations aren't as powerful as others. Or maybe I just haven't played it a billion times, like the designers, to find out which combinations work and what you should do with them. There's a lot of different strategies. Even every time you play it, you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. You feel like you might be restricted on the movement a little bit, but really, the way the game works out, it's pretty cool. Some people have different abilities you can play to maybe move a space, and one space in this game really matters. Board positioning matters as well. Uh, it might just be my play group, but we tend to stay around the relics a whole lot, uh, though we've kind of got away from that just because it seems like, depending on the character you pick, you might want to stay away from that because you might be too close to combat, and you might want to jump into the, or start off in the, in the, edge of the map and kind of build up your stuff and then go in and start you know whipping on people but either way it's a phenomenal game it replay it there's a game that used to be out uh that i really liked it was the wow the world of warcraft miniatures game this kind of doesn't really have a lot in common with the game but it gives me that same feel it scratches that itch and i think it's a phenomenal little miniature combat game and i'll pretty much be kidding everything from this uh from now on especially for team play that's where i really find it interesting uh, another note on that team play is, you know, your guy dies, but you come back, and now do you focus on that one guy who's dead or restored, or do you go after the teammate that you can kill and win the game with in a, in a you know, a two-on-two -two game? So really cool aspect. I really like that because it, it eliminates the player elimination, even though it's still there slightly. But either way, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to email me at timjanette at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter below. And until next time, keep them rocking and rolling dice. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.